Uh, now, never, never intending to, uh, to offend, but sometimes, you know, the, well, the Word of God, it's either going to be a step for you or it's going to be a stone that you trip over. It's one of the two things. That's just the way it is. You know, there's, there's not many, you know, there, there's very few people that are kind of middle of the road about Christianity. They either love you or they hate you. Have you noticed that? They either, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, Christianity's awesome, or, oh, I can't stand Christians. Nobody's just like, eh. <laughs> it's just not that way. Because then that's what the Bible says. You know, either the cross is it's going to offend you or it's going to save you. And uh, so I just want to talk to us about the Holy Ghost. Somebody say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. So there we go. We started off right there. There, there are some churches you can't say Holy Ghost. You have to say Holy Spirit. Because Holy Ghost, that's a little spooky. You might, cheer, you know, scare the children, but, with the, you know, don't get the cheerings all upset by saying ghost, you know. But it's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, it's not scary. It's God's Spirit. Yeah. Brother Hester, wave at me over there. I'll, he says this to me ever so often, and I just love it. He'll say to me, because uh, he, he knows I know the answer, but he'll say, so where'd the Holy Ghost come from? And I'll just play along. I, I don't know. And he'll say, he'll say, well, somebody had to die if there's going to be a ghost. And I said, that's right. So who died? And he says, Jesus died. Come on, somebody. And the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells in you. Amen? Amen? The same power, the same spirit that lived in Jesus lives in you. And the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is just simply an overflow of that. And so when we're talking about this today, I, man, if, you, if we're going to talk about speaking in tongues, and we're going to talk about all kinds of crazy stuff, I might even share with you some stories of some really crazy stuff. Uh, it's not to, uh, not to get anybody upset. And so I, I believe next Sunday, depending on if we get some response, I believe next Sunday I'm going to talk on this subject again, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to answer your questions. So if you have a question of, well, I've heard this, or speaking in tongues is of the devil, I want you to send me an email about that, or text me, or you can find me, just Google Gary Birkins, I cannot hide, seems to be the only Gary Birkins on the planet, believe it or not. Anyway, uh, just, you can find me, and if you're watching on YouTube, we will, we will address your questions next Sunday, okay? Is that all right? How many, I mean, does anybody have questions about the Holy Spirit? Nobody? Nobody wants to raise your hand because you don't want to be, I don't want to be controversial. You know, you got you to act all spiritual. You got to act like you know the, the answers. It's true. Uh, let's just start with this. Before I, before I, uh, before I even really understood, before I had any concept of being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, it happened to me. And... And so before I, you know, it's kind of like the bumblebee, you know, don't tell the bumblebee he's too fat to fly, because he doesn't know that, and so he just flies in, I mean, you know, just aerodynamically, they say a bumblebee is not supposed to fly, and so we don't tell them that, because cause it would freak him out, because he just flies. And, uh, and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues about 10 or 11 years of age, and I kind of shared a little bit about this last few weeks ago. Um, I was at a Sunday night service that was one of those services, it was the adult service, you know, you know generally in church, if you have, remember, y'all remember the days when you had Sunday night church? Anybody remember that? Man, church would start at 6 o'clock, you'd go to 9.30, 10 o'clock, then you go to Dairy Queen afterwards, it'd be, it'd be, it, it's like, it was like Saturday night at the club, man, because you didn't get home till 1 in the morning, right? Anybody remember those days? Y'all, y'all remember the club days, y'all don't remember the Sunday night church days. Yeah, so yeah, oh, I'm, oh I, I, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so uh, it was one of the, and so Sunday night services used to be, it was just where the church folk came, you know, the, the, the hardcore church folk, you know, you weren't going to offend anybody, and so you never knew what was going to happen. But the kids didn't have church, they just, they just sat on the pew, or they colored, or they slept, uh, any pew sleepers, there we go, that's a good Pentecost crew right there, when you, when you grew up sleeping under a church pew, right? Yeah, I, I remember sleeping in my mom's lap, sleeping... You know, on, on, I remember waking up having that waffle pattern on your face because <laughs> of the, yeah, I remember those days, man. Uh, and I remember getting bored at church, you know, some of y'all are adults, y- y'all get, we all get bored at, there's different times. I remember the preacher talking, just, nyam, 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 like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher or whatever, you know, I don't know what he's saying. Uh, and, 
I, I just wasn't really, I mean, I was, I was a kid. I was 10, just a kid. And uh, there was this, this Sunday night service. It wasn't any different than any other service. And, um, man, just the Spirit of God moved in that room. And I woke up two and a half hours after church, have been laid on my back. I don't remember this other than I knew something was happening to me. But it was two and a half hours after church, I consciously came to, and my mom and dad are still crying, and they're just like, you've been speaking in tongues for two and a half hours. And it radically changed my life. The, and I have to say that with some relativity, because I don't know what my life would be like if that hadn't have happened. There's, there, there was a, a covering, a... I'll just say this, there was a power that God implanted in me, and I know it, it kept me from so many things. I'm a normal guy, I'm a normal person, uh, but that made me abnormal. And, uh, and it protected me. And I really believe that, that that event in my life is what is the reason I'm able to stand on this stage today, is because God put His power in me. And... I don't know if you think this way or not, but when I read the Bible and it talks about that Jesus healed the sick, and then it says that we're supposed to do greater things than that, I don't know about you, but that makes me uncomfortable if I'm not, you know, if this, if this is the bar and, and I'm like, here's aspirin, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that's what Jesus meant when he said heal the sick, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, Jesus is walking around, he's bringing dead people back to life. You know, we don't, we don't do that much anymore. Actually, I don't think we do that in America very often at all. There are opportunities, and that does happen. But I think what's happened in, in even, even just preparing this message today, knowing what I'm going to speak about, I could feel a spiritual hindrance in my, in my spirit. Oh, don't talk about that because people are going to get upset. You're going to offend somebody. You probably don't want to put this message on YouTube, because people are going to find out you're a holy roller. Well, the reality is, if somebody's got cancer, and we have the ability to heal them, that's how you pack a church out. I mean, now, now granted, you can pack a church out and give a free car away every Sunday. You can pack a church out, you know, you can do bingo night, pack a bingo hall out, Right? I mean, we can do free pizza, and, you know, for a while, you know, unless you don't like that brand of pizza. But the, you know, you raise a couple of, couple of people from the dead, and uh, <laughs> you can't shut people up then, right? And I know in my life, the, you know, the thing that happened when, when I was really young, uh, people then, became, you know, as I got older, people began to try to talk me out of that. Well, that was just an emotional thing. Well... First of all, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll do a lot of this next week. First, we'll, you know, kind of do some, some answers. Uh, but first of all, um, we're emotional people, right? Y'all get emotional about all kinds of stuff. Y'all get emotional when somebody cuts you off in traffic, <laughs> right? You get emotional sitting in a doctor's waiting room. I can't believe I have to be here on time and he's two hours late. We get emotional about all kinds of stuff. So why would we not get emotional about when God's Spirit moves in our life and touches us? Why, why you, know, you know, when Ryan steps on the stage and he starts, you know, crying, that's, that's why not? What's wrong with that? The, the question should be, why aren't you emotional about God? Why, why can't God move you, but football can? Why are you more emotional about not getting to eat at a certain time of the day? <laughs> They call that hangry, right? Yeah, why, why, why does that set you off but not a hunger for the presence of God, right? And so, uh, so please, if you have a question, uh, I've got a few already written down for next week, but if you have a question uh, about the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, send me an email, find me on Facebook, send me a message, and, and we'll, I'll put in the message next week. But I want to talk to you about... Uh, the Bible says in the Old Testament, there are these moments, there are these just God moments where you have a normal guy and the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon them 
and they did supernatural feats. And, and then you have Jesus comes along, and Jesus embodied the presence of God. And it wasn't these moments when he did supernatural things. Everywhere he went, supernatural things happened. And then Jesus went to heaven, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'm just giving you a synopsis. Jesus goes to heaven, and he tells the disciples, he says, wait in Jerusalem till you're endued or filled or clothed with power from on high. And then we see the disciples, they do all these amazing things. And then there's us. <laughs> I don't mean that bad, but then there's us. What are we waiting on? Isn't it true that in, in the typical church, to, or let me, I would say the typical church, I would say in, in some church environments, we don't have room for the move of God. Or let me put it this way. We don't have time for the move of God. Church has got to be out by a certain time because there's another group of people coming in. And I'm not, saying there's not, there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having more than one service. If we, if we can spend an hour and a half or we can spend 45 minutes and, and have church, but we haven't really had the power of God move, what are we doing? You know, I mean, time's a ticking. You guys are getting older. I'm staying the same age, but everybody else is aging quick. <laughs> I was looking at myself in the mirror the other day. I'm like, man, I don't feel that old on the inside looking out. Does anybody get that? You know, it's like on the inside, I feel like I'm like 20, man. But I look at them, I'm like, who is... What? Who is that guy? What happened to your eyes? Anyway, there's an exclusive group of guys in the Old Testament. Joshua. Remember Joshua? Man, Joshua was the guy that went across the Jordan River and he came back with a good report when everybody else had a bad report. The Bible says that when, when, eight, when, when uh, uh, Moses prayed over Joshua, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he was, he was a guy... But he became a conqueror for Israel. And when he went back across the Jordan River with the armies of God, they took walls of Jericho and planted them deep in the ground. That kind of power. That they walked around a city and the walls fell down. Man, that's some Holy Ghost power. But that happened because the Spirit of God came upon him. You have Gideon. Man, Gideon, the Bible, God tells Gideon, I'm going to use you. And Gideon's a lot like us. He's like, who, me? You can't use me because we all know ourselves, right? I mean, I don't think, if, here's the thing. If you feel super spiritual, you're probably just full of pride. If you, if you don't feel spiritual, that's probably a great place because then God's like, I can use you, but you know it won't be you. You'll have to rely on me. And so that's Gideon. He's like, God's like, I'm, I want to use you. And Gideon's like, what, what are you talking about? I, I, I live, I, I have the worst family of all the families. I, I'm in, I'm in, in the, the smallest tribe of all of Israel. And I'm the youngest of my family. And, and if it was me, he would have said, and I'm also not the tallest one either. And he had all, this, all these qualifications of why God shouldn't use him. But that's why God picked him. And the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Man, what I want to have happen today is I want the Spirit of the Lord to come upon us. He said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He took his trumpet and he blew it. And with one trumpet blast, without email, without text messages, without Facebook ads, he, he rallied an army of 32,000 people blowing one horn. Some of you can't get people to help you move. He took a ram's horn, blew it one time, and 32,000 people said, what do you need? I'm ready to go. And then God's like, whoa, you blew that horn a little too heavy, buddy. You're going to have to send home a whole... He had to send home everybody but 300... He only needed 300 people. He got 32,000 people. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And what I'm trying to tell you is if we have God's Spirit living and flowing out of us on a daily basis, we will have more than enough. We'll quit living in the land of never enough. We'll go right through the land of just enough. And we'll end up in the land of abundance of more than enough. Man, that's the way I want to live my life. You know, I've had, I've had a tough year. Y'all know that. 
I'll tell you what, I've seen God restore, restore, restore. He is in the restoration business. Things that, have, that I didn't even, I, it wasn't even on the radar that I was even looking for or asking for, boom, shows up. And when it shows I'm like, whoa, God, you are just, anyway. Samson, we've been, this whole sermon series is really based on Samson. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Do you know Samson, he, he, he slew a thousand men with the donkey bone, with the jawbone of a donkey? Man! He caught, we talked about this a few weeks ago, he caught 300 foxes. You haven't even seen three foxes in your whole life. He caught 300 of them. Crazy man, ties their tails together, sets them on fire, and burns up all the fields of all of his enemies. When an enemy knocks on, you know, we're, we're like triple locking our locks because we're so afraid somebody might just happen to come by and get in. And this guy is burning up the food supply of his enemy with 300 fox. I don't think anybody's picking on him. Why? It's because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Man. David. We all, y'all love, how many y'all, let me, let me see the David lovers. Come on, where's David's people at? Yeah, we all feel like, man, we could... We've all had some kind of Goliath come up in our life, and we just want to punch him in the face. And, you know, I, I, man, there was a bully when I was in school, and he would pick me up and throw me across the classroom, put me in a trash can a few times. I mean, just was always picking up, just because I was this little guy, and he had failed a year. He was like Goliath, man, to me. He was like, I, I wanted to bring a slingshot to school, man. I'd, I'd take you down, buddy. You can just picture it in PE, you know, I got the whole side here and the whole side here, me and him square off, you know. But what would really happen is he'd just punch me in the nose and I'd run home crying. But uh, anyway, I did have one moment when he picked me up by the shirt and he was fixing to throw me across the room and he's just picking me up and he's just shaking me. There's nothing more embarrassing than being a guy somebody's just manhandling you like you're like a little rag doll. You know, he's, just, he's just shaking me and he's saying, I don't know what he's saying. And I, I lost my mind, I just went boom and punched him right smack in the nose. Didn't work out too well. I still went flying across the room. <laughs> anyway, it's a whole, with a whole lot more force. We all have had those. We've all, we always want to. We always want to be David. Do you know David was anointed by Samuel, and the Bible says that when he was anointed, that the that the, the, the the spirit of the Lord came upon him. That's before he killed Goliath. And if there's Goliaths in your life, if there's things in your life that you can't fix. And I know there are. You need the Spirit of God to come upon you. But today we have the ability for not to just come upon us, but to live in us and flow out of us. The Bible says that from your belly shall flow. Somebody say flow. flow. Somebody say flow. Come on, say it again. Flow. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It talks about that, it, you know, rivers coming out of the desert where there's no hope of being water. So it doesn't matter how dry you are. It doesn't matter how me- bad you've messed up. It doesn't matter the things you've done wrong. The Bible says that when his spirit comes in you, it'll flow out of you rivers of living water. Man, that's what we need. That'll change you. It'll change the world. Man, Elijah, Elisha, just a quick list. Elijah, these two different guys, in case you thought I said the same thing twice. Elijah and Elisha, just to confuse you about the Bible, I know. Uh, Elijah stopped, he could stop and he could start rain. Man, that's the guy I want on my baseball team right there. We start getting behind, come on Elijah, it's got to rain a little bit, man. We got to have a rain out, you know. <laughs> you know, when, when you, you got to mow the yard, you don't really want to. Sorry, honey, it's raining. <laughs> Yeah, stop and start the rain. Uh, this lady's running out of food, and he, he enabled her cupboards never to go empty. You know, she would empty it out, and it would replenish. Uh, he raised the dead. He called fire from heaven. Yeah, you think you got a Hemi in your truck, man. There you are at the red light, and all of a sudden, fire comes down from heaven and just burns up the road in front of you, man. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. You know, you don't need that here, but anyway. But anyway. <laughs> He called fire down to win battles. He parted the Jordan River. You know, I'm not a shoe fanatic, but, you know, I've got a foot issue, and so I I have to spend a little more money on shoes. That's why you see me wear tennis shoes all the time. Uh, 
And so I'm just picturing, you know, you know, you get, you ever got close to the mud puddle or some muddy spot? You're like, you know, can you just imagine if you could just be like mud puddle part for me in Jesus' name? You know, I mean, how can, you know, I just, you know, he just, he did I'm not going to, I'm not going to get wet in this river. I'm just going to move it out of the way. I mean, we don't even think, see, the, 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 real, the reality is we don't even think right because we think with, with, because of a lack of power from God. We think from a place of what can I do? If we had to get across a river, we're either going to build a boat, we're going to build a bridge, we're going to tunnel under it. But nobody thinks in the realm of moving the river. Nobody thinks that way. But God does. Now, I'm not saying you need to move a river, you know, I mean, good Lord, you know, we're going down to, you know, the Brazos, and we get there and the Brazos is gone because Sherry decided she didn't like it there. I mean, you know, you got your fishing pole and your raft and your tubes and, you know, trying to get the kids all excited and you get there and the river's gone because... You know, Sherry's over there, I just didn't want to see the river today. I mean, that would be, a, you know, be obnoxious. You know, like, come on. But there are rivers in our life that just wash us away. There's rivers like where I'm talking about. There's these rivers of anxiety and fear that will just carry us away, just overwhelm us. We're just caught up in the torrent, the torrent of life. And that river's just carrying us a place we never intended to go. Man, there's people in your family they need you to stop that river. The only way you can do that is through the power of God. The Spirit of God comes upon you. So Elijah, and then Elisha comes along. He's the counterpart of Elijah. He's the protege. And Elisha, he parted the Jordan River as well. He parted the rivers of Jericho. He gave oil for a widow. He, he took care of a, a lady's son that died. Uh, he raised the dead. He multiplied bread. He healed leprosy. Some guys out cutting wood with a borrowed air, borrow something. You should never borrow something. It's going to break. You should just go buy you one because you're going to have to buy it anyway. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You borrow the wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow breaks. Now they have a new wheelbarrow. You still don't have one. Right? You should have just bought you a wheelbarrow because you've got to buy one anyway. That's the way it happens. So this guy's out there chopping wood with the borrowed axe. Guess what happens? The axe breaks. The head of the axe flies off and lands in the river. Elijah's like, I mean, Elisha's like, don't worry about that. I got it. And he walks over to the river, and that metal axe head floats to the top. Tell me God's not interested in just the little details of your life. I mean, what's the, what's the big mountain-moving, nation-changing thing about, you know, I mean, he could have went to Harbor Freight and got a new axe head for 20 bucks. Got the 20% coupon, you know, he could have saved some money, right? And, and got to have a great guy day. Anybody love Harbor Freight? Come on. I can't believe we don't have more Harbor Freight lovers in the room. <laughs> anyway, they got knife sharpeners. They got everything. Anything you need. Anyway. Some, some women might take offense to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's, yeah, and that's the thing. God is interested not... Every battle in your life is, doesn't have to be some spiritual kind of thing. It could just be... You know, I want my shopping cart to quit making that clacky sound. I mean, if it's important to you, it's important to God. You know, I mean, God is the, big, the, big, the biggest thing and the greatest God of the universe, or He's not. So this guy's axe head falls off and he's distraught because he doesn't have money to buy a new one. And the Spirit of the Lord comes up on Elisha and he causes that metal axe head to swim. The Bible says it swam to the top. Man, what's that look like? <laughs> Elisha, after he's dead, there is still a residual anointing. The power of God is still in his corpse. And they laid him in a tomb. And years later, there's a battle going on. And these men are running for their lives. And one of them gets killed. And he dies in the journey. And so his two buddies, they take him and they put him in haste because they're trying to get away from an army that's chasing them. In haste, they just chunk him in this cave. And it happened to be the cave where Elisha was buried. And this dead man landed on the bones of Elisha and jumped back up and ran out of the tomb and caught up with his buddies. Now, you can choose to believe that or not. And if you don't believe that, don't worry. It will never happen to you. If you don't believe fajitas are good, don't worry. You'll never get to try them. 
But if you dare to believe that there is a power like that still in existence today, you have the opportunity to believe it. Man, can you imagine his buddies? All of a sudden he just flies past them. It's like, wait a minute. Bob, where are you going? They might have freaked him out. They might have thought he was a ghost. They might have thought, what in the heck is happening? Oh, God, Bob, Bob's even afraid of the enemy. He's dead. You know, I don't know. They catch up at the 7-Eleven, and there's Bob sleeping, you know, sucking down the therapy, and he's like, man, I don't know what happened. I just came back to life. Man, I just can't imagine. That's a church growth program right there. That's how to grow a church right there. You just have a few people at your church that just, you know, you just say, hey, if you were dead last week, stand up. <laughs> I see that hand. <laughs> Come on, I see that hand. I see that. Well, yeah, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of, right? Let's do that. If you were a drug addict in your life, stand up. Come on, somebody. Man, I want to have people in our church that are just like, I don't know what happened. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Mm. I, don't ha I can't explain it to you. I can't whoop out the Bible and give you the Greek and the Hebrew and tell you all this. But I can tell you what I do know. One day I was dead, but now I'm alive. Man. Man. Woo. Mm. So I wrote this. Let me read this to you. It would be better if I just read it instead of trying to say it again and mess it up. So what do you turn to when life brings something bigger than you? When the answer for a situation simply does not exist within human ability, where do you go when only a supernatural power will do? Is it po possible that some emotional, physical, and addictive behaviors in your life are simply because you're trying to use a physical power to fix a spiritual problem? Consider depression, the body's physical answer to emotional overload, or the mind's way to cope with extreme problems. What about rage, an episode of anger and fighting and screaming at someone? Isn't that simply a lack of power in a situation? Isn't it true that gossip and putting others down is just a way to make yourself feel better? What do you turn to when you're not good enough, tall enough, smart enough, cute enough? Where do you go when you don't have the answer, the solution, or can't find the way out? Aren't you tired of trying to use physical things to meet spiritual needs? You won't find the answer in a syringe or a pill we're at the bottom of a bottle. What we need is a supernatural power. The answer, and the answer, what we need is a supernatural power that has the answer of life. Without power, we are limited to our own ability. And our solutions are solely based on, on us, fallen man. But with God's power, all things are possible. The jail cell of addiction is open wide. Mountains move, devils tremble, sickness has to flee, the chains of depression is broken, chaos is calmed, and we are free in His power. <clears throat> Simply put, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So Jesus comes on the scene. For three and a half years, he blows people's minds. And when he walks down the street, crowds just begin to follow him. It's because of the power that he wielded. He, he would walk into a room and the environment would change. It was like, I don't want to say it this way, but I don't know how else to say it. It was like if a celebrity walked in the room. Some of you, some of you wouldn't notice who it was because you don't know. I may, I probably, like, I don't know who that is. And everybody else would be like, "Oh man," to be this whispering going along. You know, 
if, if Donald Trump walked in, whether you hate him or not, it would cause a disruption just because of the position he holds. Jesus, when he walked down the street, there was such a power on him that people were drawn to him. You know, the way we, the way we reach the lost now is we beg people. You know, please come to church with me. Please, please. If you, you're gonna, we have to, we have, what we have to do is we have to manipulate them and use fear. You're going to go to hell. You're going to burn forever. Do you like fire? It says that there's worms there. Do you want worms to eat you? That's what, we, that's what we result to when we don't have power. People that condemn sinners are people that are powerless. People that point their finger and say, oh, you're evil and you're dirty and you're nasty and, and I can't believe you do that. It's because they don't have power. But people that have power that walk around like Jesus, not one time did he say to somebody, you're evil and you're going to hell. He walked around and he met people's needs because of the power that was in him. Man, we need that kind of power today. When he walked on the scene, he messed up everything. It wasn't like, oh, he had this moment of the Spirit of God came upon him and then he was just like any other man. No, he was never like any other man. He walked around in the power of God himself. When he spoke, it was as if you could hear God the Creator say, let there be light. Because when he spoke, things lit up. When he spoke, things happened. When he went to a funeral, there was no more funeral. Come on, I want to be at a funeral like that. Man, can you imagine the hearse is going down the road. Everybody's pulling to get out of the way except you. You're like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Open up the hearse, pull the coffin out. And you're, people are going to think you're inside. Now, please don't do this unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> you think those cops are there just to protect traffic. They might turn on you in a minute. But man, what, what, what if the story changed? What if we realize the power that we have at our disposal? What if we just begin to believe that maybe it's true? You see, you don't get, it doesn't get talked about much. Because when those kind of things happen, it messes up the program. It messes up the system. It, 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 people then can't be in charge of it. You can't control it. When the, the church we have now is a church that's controlled by people. We can control it. We can make it happen. We'll not make it happen, but we can, we can fit it in our little box. It's not very messy. But when somebody comes up out of a coffin and their life is forever changed, it changes everything. When a devil screams out in the middle of service and you hear this blood-curdling scream and it beats chills down your spine, everybody wants to run away, but that one person stands up and says, Oh, no, you don't. In Jesus' name, come out of them. And that devil comes up out of them. Man, that just doesn't fit in a normal, you know, two-clap church service. It doesn't just fit in the, you know, I don't know where that's at on the schedule. We didn't put that on planning center. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what to tell you, but that's what happened in the Bible. If, if we're not going to be the church of the Bible, what church are we of? Mm. So Jesus walks around. Man, I don't even know what time it is. I'm, it's only 10 o'clock. We'll look at that, man, because we didn't fix that clock up there. Time change Sunday. I love you. <laughs> Get a, we're going to make up that hour right now. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. Jesus comes and he just messes up the whole thing. All the priests and the scribes, they had all their systems and their methods. You know, you can't heal. Jesus got in trouble for healing people at church on Sunday. Could you imagine that? He heals a guy on the Sabbath, and then the guy goes to church, and they're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? He's like, well, I got healed on the way to church. And you're like, well, who healed you? We don't heal people on the Sabbath. We don't do any kind of work on the Sabbath. Jesus got in trouble for healing people on the Sabbath. That's how, how much they wanted to control things. And a lot of the, a lot of the questions that we're going to talk about next week is from that same root, the same antichrist spirit that put Jesus in a tomb that nailed him on a cross is still alive and well today. And it will tell you, you can't speak in tongues because that's of the devil. It'll tell you there's no power like that. God doesn't raise people from the dead. Have you ever seen it? Well, if you haven't seen it, obviously it can't happen. Well, who, who, who died and made you boss? Right? Come on. When, when did you 
create the world? When did you put all this in motion? You know, the scientists got together years ago and they were going to make man. They were going to make their own. They said, we, could, we got you. God, this is a joke, by the way. They were going to... They were going to... They, <laughs> sometimes you got to clear things up. And so they're, they're, they're got this, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have, you're going to go head to head with God. And God's just sitting over there on his little stool like, all right, let's do this, you know. And so, you know, we're, we're going to make man. They're telling you, we're going to create, you know, a human life. And so they pull out their big buckets of dirt and they get it all ready. And, they, and God goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Y'all got to get your own dirt. Yeah, you see? Who made you boss? Anyway. So Jesus dies on a cross. And they thought they had shut up him. They thought they had stopped this unruly behavior. They thought, finally, we've got control again. But, <laughs> in true Jesus fashion, the stone rolled away. And that which was corruptible became incorruptible. That which was dead became alive again. The impossible just became possible. And he didn't ask people if they liked it. He didn't ask if he could do that. He didn't ask for permission. Because that's what power does. And he came out of that tomb on the third day. We got Easter coming in a few weeks. What an exciting time. Man, he comes out of the tomb. He hangs out with the disciples. You know, just to really mess up people. I mean, it would been one thing if the tomb was just empty and no one ever saw him again. Because, you know, then people would say, well, someone stole the body. And they tried to say that. Except that Jesus hung out for a while. He didn't just zoop off to heaven, you know. I mean, he hung out for a while. He went to people's house, at, at, had dinner with them. You know, they didn't even open the door. He just came right through the wall. You know, just, yeah. You know, man, I want to show up for Thanksgiving that way, man. Just come walk. Right. How did you get in? I just walked right through the wall. That's what, you know, that's what Jesus did. Ate food with them. You know, he, was, he was human, but he wasn't. You know, he was, but he was, he was God. And then right before he leaves, right before he finally he's going he's gonna to ascend and he's going to go to heaven, now, if this is the last time you're going to see somebody, if you knew this was the last time you were going to see me today, I'm sure you would have something you'd want to tell me. You'd give me some kind of advice, or you'd, you know, I always want to tell you this, Pastor Gary, but I don't really like you, or whatever it is, you know. You'd want to get it off your chest. You know, it's your last, it's your last meeting with me, okay? And so, so Jesus, he has his disciples around him, and he has this opportunity to give them his last piece of advice. I think we should listen to it because if he was here today and he gave us our last... Now some of you wouldn't bring a notepad. I, I question you. You have a phone. You have a notepad right there. But sometimes you just can't... You know, you just... It's just too much trouble to pull that out and turn it on. Anyway. But <laughs> the disciples, they gather around and they lean in because he goes, I've got something I've got to tell you. And I, I want to read it to you. It's Luke chapter 24, verse 49. He's been talking to them about power and stuff. And here, here it is in Luke chapter 24. He says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. Here it comes. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Do you see those words? He gives them a very direct message. Stay in the city until you, in the King James it says, endued with power some, some versions say, until you are filled with power from on high. Now, some of us, I just know us. I know some of you honorary people. After he said that, some of you would say, what do you think he meant by that? I would say he meant stay in the city. So don't leave the city. If you're outside the city limits, you're not following instructions. Stay in the city until you get something you don't have, until you get some power. And so the disciples knew exactly what he said, so that's what they did. They stayed in the city until they were endued with power from on high. If you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read chapter, or verses 4 and 5, and we're going to jump down to verse 8. This is the same thing. It, they, so they all gathered, these people that were with Jesus, they got some more friends, they went to this place called the upper room, and they... This is what happens. 
And they remind, they're reminding each other while they're here. And it says, and while staying with them, he ordered that they not depart from Jerusalem. Who ordered? Jesus did. But wait for the promise. Here's the same words. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And here it comes. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this is in Acts chapter 1. And Acts chapter 2 is when it happens. Acts chapter 2, because they were obedient, the power of God fell on the disciples. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. And if you're, if, you're true, if you're true Pentecost, you can preach a whole message on that. Come on, you get a good ride, and suddenly. And anyway, <laughs> suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy, Go Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, when you talk about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it always gets off on tongues. Jesus never said, go wait in Jerusalem until you speak in some crazy language. He didn't say that. He said until the promise of the Father comes. And then he talks about that more in Acts, that the, pro the promise of the Father is John said, I will baptize you in water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with power. Some verses say fire, Holy Spirit and power, or Holy Spirit and fire. It never says Holy Spirit and tongues. But that's what we all want to talk about. Right. What's up with the speaking in tongues things, man? That's just crazy. Well, who cares? I mean, really, if you got power, who cares if you got tongues? You know, Alex got this little cool car. It's a little, little Mini Cooper. And he got this little sport button. He pushes a sport. Can I talk about your car for a second? It's pretty cool. It's blacked out. It's pretty awesome. Little Mini Cooper. It's all tricked out. There's a little sport button. Stick shift. And some of y'all are not driving stick shifts. I don't know what's wrong with you. Man, you need a stick shift. You've got to be able to shift. Anyway, side note. He's got his little button, and he pushes that little button, and it drives differently. I mean, the suspension changes, and it gets more power. It hits the power bands earlier. I'm a mechanic. I know what I'm talking about. So things change, but what really happens is it makes this little popping sound coming out of the tailpipe because it's burning up that extra fuel because, man, you know, we're Americans. And we like to burn up some gas and burn off the ozone area. And, you know, don't hate me. Anyway, it's a German car. There you go. So, uh, so when you push that little button, you get this little... It's like, man, I love that, Alex. My little car does it some, but I don't have a button that makes it do it. You know, but that just, that just, it just sounds so good. You know, and you don't have to have the pop, 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 but you can't have the power without that. You know, those indie cars, have you ever seen indie racing? We don't get to watch that on television much now. But, you know, those indie cars are like zipping through these little towns, you know, like Indianapolis, not Indianapolis, but like the, the, I don't know what you call them, the little tiny little cars. And when they, when they downshift to go around a turn, if you see the tailpipes, there's fire coming out of that. If you ever go to NASCAR, any NASCAR fans? Wow, two. Okay. <laughs> they, they do races at night, and they say that I've never been. They say the coolest thing is because you see, man, when they, when they decelerate, there's, there is fire coming. What is that? It's the excess. That's what it is. It's the excess. There's so much fuel going through that engine to get it to a certain power level to, you know, to burn off the rubber tires and make all the cool smoke that we like to see. But to, to do that, you also have a little extra come through it. And this is not the explanation of what tongues is, but in some ways, that's what it is exactly. It's because your body don't know what to do. Your mouth doesn't know what to say. You're, a language can come out of you and you have no clue what you're saying, but your spirit knows. It's not like you just checked out and your brain's not working either. It's not that at all. It's just something is so powerful in you that it comes out of you and there's an excess. And we'll talk more about that next week. So please don't think that speaking in tongues is having fuel coming out of your mouth and you got fire coming out of your mouth. It's not it at all. So the disciples, these guys that were, they were with Jesus before, they, uh, before, before, you remember the disciples? There's these 12 guys, you know, they're, they're a ragtag bunch. They're not, 
you know, they, they're, not, they're not polished. Let me just put it that way. They're not polished people. You know, they don't, they don't know to put their pinky up, you know, when they drink coffee. Uh, matter of fact, if they went to Starbucks with you and they saw that little thing on there, you know, the little, what do they call that? The little flower-looking thing on top? The foam? Yeah, but it's not just foam. It's like, you know, it's in a certain little design. I can just imagine if Peter saw that, he'd be like, because he'd never seen nothing like that before. He, would, he wouldn't want to drink it. He'd just be like, well, let's get a picture of that, because I've never seen anything like that before. They're not, they haven't been out a lot in society and learned how to really adapt to the cultured people. Now, they're very cultural, but they're not real cultured. And so they're hanging with Jesus, and, man, they're saying the wrong things. I made a list. I like to make lists. You know, Jesus is healing the sick, raising the dead. Peter wants to know, all right, now when you get to heaven, where am I going to sit? You know, who's going to get, we know you got a throne. When you get on your throne, can I sit right by, or are you going to pick John? Because we know you like John better than me. That's the kind of conversations. You know, Jesus is like preaching these messages that we're still talking about today, and Peter wants to know where he's going to sit when he gets to heaven. He's just like us. Okay? He's not like me. One of the other disciples very often come up with this question. So, trying to act dignified. So who will be the greatest of all the disciples? Just like us. You know, all these little pity, grade school, junior high. <laughs> My favorite ones. The kids are trying to get around Jesus. You know, they just want to be where Jesus is. And the disciples are like, no, no, get away. He doesn't like kids. Go away. You know, because they didn't like kids. You're going to get your sticky fingers on him. You know, take your pacifier and leave. You know, they're just trying to keep the kids. Because Jesus is over here doing adult, big time, you know, church stuff and taking care of needs and keep the babies away. You know, we, we kind of do that in church still anyway, but that's a whole other sermon. But anyway, and then Jesus says, what are you doing? And then he quotes, and Jesus makes a scripture that we quote all the time. He says, suffer the little kids to come to me. And he puts a little kid on his lap. And he says, unless you become like a little kid, you can't even get to heaven. And then the same disciples there are like, yeah, come on, bring the babies. Bring the babies. <laughs> right? That's what I said all along, John. What's wrong with you? You know, going down the street, going down the street, people are all around Jesus. And, and Jesus is healing people. And this blind guy is going, hey, over here. Hey, over here. Hey, and, and, you know, disciples go, hey, shh, hush, hey, oh, shh, stop it. <laughs> Quiet down, you blind man, you're messing up everything. And he cries out even the louder. And Jesus goes over and heals him. <laughs> They're in a crowd. In a crowd of people, and this lady can't get to Jesus, and she pushes through the crowd. She ends up falling down, probably. And she's having to crawl through the crowd, and she's on her hands and knees, and she stretches out, and she just touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops and says, "Who touched me?" And the disciples, in their great wisdom, they have this to say: "What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody's touching you." A better question would be, "Who didn't touch you?" And Jesus is like, "No." No, somebody touched me because I felt the healing power come out of my body. And then this little lady says, it was me. It was me. And that issue that she had in her body for over 12 years was instantly healed. One of our great miracles that we love to talk about was feeding of the 5,000. You know, as the disciples, that before that happened, the disciples go to Jesus. And, he, and they said to Jesus, Jesus, you need to send these people home because they're hungry. What they were saying was, you need to send these people home because we're hungry. And Jesus said, well, if they're hungry, feed them. And he just messed up stuff. And so he put the responsibility on them, and they found a sack lunch. And Jesus took that little sack lunch, five loaves and two fishes, and he began to break it, and he fed 5,000 people. These disciples, man, they just they couldn't say, say the right thing half the time. They're in a storm in a boat. The boat's sinking. You know, they're going to Jesus. Don't you care that we're going to die? What's wrong with you? Why are you sleeping? They wake him up, and he goes and says, peace be still, and the storm stops. They're the same ones that when Jesus was walking on the water, they're like, oh, my God, it's a devil. It's the same guys. The same guys. The whole three and a half years of Jesus, it's story after story of people saying the wrong thing. 
It was Peter that when they came to get Jesus, Jesus said, they're going to take me, they're going to kill me. And Peter's like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, not on on my watch. And, And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Always saying the wrong thing. The soldiers come and they go to take Jesus away. Man, Peter, man, he whoops out his sword and he cuts off the soul, trying to cut the guy's head off and missed. Couldn't even cut a guy's head off good. And misses and cuts off this guy's ear. Jesus, who is now probably handcuffed and tied up, has to stop and say, give me just a minute, and gets his hand freed and puts the guy's ear back on. Peter, just like us, denying Jesus. They hang him on a tree. Jesus had given him a fair warning. Just hours before he had told him, one of you is going to deny me. He looks at Peter and goes, you will deny me. And he says, not me, God. I will never deny you. There's no way. You see, these men in this time in their life, they were like a lot of Christians. They believed in God and they followed God, but they were not filled with the power of God. We always say and we do the wrong things. We ask the wrong question. We, we, we have to go back and repent because we, 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 we know we shouldn't have said that. We shouldn't have told them off. We shouldn't have done this. We shouldn't have done that. And it's simply because we don't have the power of God living in us. It's because when Jesus said to you, you need to stay and you need to wait for power, we said, I've got other things to do. Well, Peter, here he is, and Jesus is dead, and they come to him on three different occasions. And every single time he says, no, I don't know him, he finally ends up cursing God to prove that he doesn't know Jesus. Just like us, just like me. There's times when you get weak and you get weary. You know what to do, but you do the wrong thing. There's not a person in this room that hasn't done the same sin more than once. Most of us all have the same propensity for, the, for a specific sin in our life and we do that sin and we repent for it and we go back and do it again even though we tell God, I will never do that again. We find ourselves in the same fear. We find ourselves in the same pit of depression. We find ourselves with the same pornography on our screen or the same bottle in our hand working our way to a drunken stupor and we do it over and over again only to then repent and say, God, I'll never do it again. It's because we have no power. Jesus comes out of the tomb. He tells them to wait for power. This same Peter, most of these are about him. This same Peter, after this power of God falls on them, they begin to experience this amazing gift of God. People from the town come running to see what the commotion is. There's a wind that blows through. There's something, a moving of the Spirit of God, and it awakens that whole area, and people come rushing to where they're at. They hear people that are speaking in languages, just multiple languages after another, and they look at those people, and they know they don't know that language, and their only explanation of what is going on is they accuse these people of being drunk. It's the only explanation. It's the only thing close. They, they've never seen any kind of behavior like this. The only thing close they've seen is it was somebody that was drunk that was just out of their mind. Peter, the same one that couldn't say the right thing, he stands up and he preaches his first message he's ever preached. Jesus has died and gone to heaven. Peter stands up now full of the power of God and speaks a message, and 5,000 people come to know Jesus. Josh, if you could come. I was at a kid's camp. 